flaming hope and ashes. Inner wisdom speaks our renewal as sweet scented flames birth ashes for our transformation. How we welcome your voice in Lenten tide, reminding us to hear your good, good news of redemption, of possibility, and of love. Welcome to Roncesvalles United Church. It is Sunday, February 21st. It's the first Sunday in the season of Lent, one of the two most sacred seasons in the Christian calendar. This past Wednesday was Ash Wednesday, which is the official beginning of Lent. And since we couldn't be together for an Ash Blessing service, we're making that Ash Blessing possible for you this Sunday. If you picked up your bag of ashes from the church, we're going to show you how to use them a little later in the service. If you didn't, don't you worry. You can do a blessing for yourself just the same. Ash Wednesday and the first uh, Sunday in Lent go together very well. One sets the intention, the second gets us going. So I think it's wonderful that we're doing both together today. We have some beautiful music to celebrate with. We have some beautiful prayers to hear. Lent may be a season of introspection, of going within, but that certainly doesn't matter, mean it's not also a season that can bring us tremendous, enriching joy. So thank you for being with us for Ash Wednesday and Lent 1. We're going to begin by having Bettina pass the peace with all of you, and then she's going to put out the first of our Lenten candles. Thank you so much, Bettina. Each week of Advent, we light one more candle as we approach Christmas Eve and the light of Christ is born into the world once more. In Lent, we extinguish one candle each week as we approach the darkness of Good Friday. Joy will return on Easter Sunday, but for now, our journey through Lent leads us within. Please join me in the passing of the peace as I put out our first Lenten candle. The peace of God be with you. And also with you. Let's sing together our Lenten song as the sun with longer journey. We're led today by David Walsh. servant Abraham out of the land of the Chaldeans, protecting him in his wanderings, who guided the Hebrew people across the desert, 
We ask that you watch over us, your servants, as we walk in the love of your name to Santiago de Compostela. Be for us our companion on the wall, our guide at the crossroads, our breath in our weariness, our protection in danger, our shade in the heat, our light in the darkness, our consolation in our discouragement, and our strength in our intentions. So that with your guidance, we may arrive safely at the end of our journey, enriched with grace and filled with joy. Amen. for the season of Lent. 
It was a day on which you kind of set your intention for the many days that were to come. The period of Lent lasts roughly 40 days. It's meant to mirror the 40 days that Jesus spent wandering in the desert, preparing for his ministry after he was baptized and before he started to say amazing things that would change people's lives. He spent time in the desert being tested by the devil. So the idea behind Lent was that we also bring something into our life that tests us, that stretches us. In fact, the word Lent means to lengthen. So Ash Wednesday seemed to be an appropriate moment to say, Lent begins now. And in fact, the tradition became that when the priest put the blessings of the ashes, which we'll get to later, on the forehead of the practitioner, that was the moment that Lent began. And it ended on the Thursday before Easter. We'll talk about that in a few weeks. So what does Ash Wednesday mean to us then? Well, as true Protestants, we get to say, if it's not in the Bible, we don't have to do it. That was the basis of the Protestant Revolution, of the rebel act that happened in the 1500s. If confession wasn't in the Bible, we weren't doing it. If absolution by priests wasn't in the Bible, we weren't doing it. They were people that really took back the scripture into their own hands and turned away from traditional teachings of the church that just didn't seem to make sense anymore. It is so easy for all of us to fall into thought patterns which don't serve us anymore. Our conditions in life change, our wishes or desires in life become new and transformed, and yet we still carry thought patterns that hold us back into a kind of childlike state sometimes of feeling guilty and small and lesser. And in a lot of ways, that's how Ash Wednesday was observed by the earliest church people. In fact, they had four tenets to Ash Wednesday and to Lent. The four tenets that we were supposed to observe were abstinence, fasting, almsgiving, and prayer. It didn't sound like a really fun time. And in fact, the basis of Lent in the earliest times was all about repentance. I mean, it made perfect sense for that time, didn't it? In the 1100s, people were living in a very different, and in many ways, regardless of what we see around us, a much more precarious kind of world. The Pope was just becoming to be established as the true head of the church. Kings of England were only just beginning to become a confirmed monarchy. There was peace nowhere. There was dissent and insurrection and war everywhere. The Vikings from Denmark had just settled on the coast of Norfolk in England. And in two generations, they were going to be fending off the Vikings from Norway. There was a great deal of turmoil in the 1100s. And so the elders of the church looked around and thought, if people are suffering so much from poverty, from war, from oppression, we must have done something wrong. God must be punishing us for the decisions that we've made. We must have to repent and atone. So Ash Wednesday became a period of exactly that, a period of atoning, of, blending, of covering yourself sometimes with true ashes and sackcloth, a time of humbling yourself before your God and simply asking for mercy for the horrible sinner that you were. In fact, the blessing of the ashes originally said either you are dust and to dust you will return, a recognition of our frailty as human beings, or repent, sinner, or die. I have to say, I have never been able to give either of those ash blessings, but that's okay, because we're the Protestant church, remember? We're the rebels. We're the ones who said that may have been okay then. But it's not okay for where we are and how we know God now. So given that Ash Wednesday doesn't even exist in the Bible, there's no time when Jesus applied ashes to his disciples' forehead, which means that as Protestants, we don't have to observe it. What is there in Ash Wednesday that might be meaningful for us? As I thought about that, I thought about those four tenets again, those four foundational ideas from the original Ash Wednesday and Lenten times. The ideas of abstinence and fasting. 
the idea of almsgiving and prayer. And what do those mean in our times? Because really, a lot of people these days find it difficult to believe in a God who punishes us for having free will, which was a gift from God. And yet, as we struggle to learn to use that free will, somehow God rejects us. A lot of people look at the Bible, as we have through our great Bible adventure, marching through those books of the Old Testament, and said, I'm not sure about that ancient theology that tells us that somehow we were separated from God, we were marked off from God. When what the Bible in fact tells us, what we see in Scripture is that no matter how often we human beings fall short, God continued to companion, continued to guide, and continued to bless. So what are we going to make of our own Ash Wednesday and Lent? What are we going to make of this idea of abstinence, fasting, of almsgiving, and prayer? Well, this is the idea that I had. I started with abstinence. Now, I was really interested to see what was it that the average person in the 1100s had to abstain from? I mean, what did they even have? If you were a peasant, the answer would be nothing whatsoever. And the earliest reference I could find to what people had to abstain from, starting in Ash Wednesday and throughout Lent, were they had to abstain from joviality, swearing, and beating their master's oxen. Okay, let's see what we can do with those if we want to celebrate Ash Wednesday our own way. Well, the idea that the peasants had to refrain from joviality was a questionable one for me. If you look at the conditions of the average person in the 1100s, joviality didn't seem to be something they would have a lot of. However, when you looked at swearing, you could well understand why they would be doing that a lot. Kicking or hurting or beating their master's oxen? Well, I'm going to say that we probably still do that, in fact. That's the one I was particularly interested in. Abstinence as a way of abstaining from cruelty means a lot in my life. Because you know the person that I kick and whip most often? Myself. All the time. The idea of showing myself self-compassion feels indulgent. If I show myself self-compassion, if I am not guilty, if I am not telling myself how far I fall short, what a miserable sinner I am, isn't that just giving myself a free ticket, a free ride? Aren't I supposed to do better than that? But in fact, studies have shown that there's a big difference between self-esteem and self-compassion. Self-esteem may lead us in good ways or bad ways, but self-compassion, showing ourselves kindness, is actually proven to do physical help to us. It lowers our blood pressure when we show ourselves kindness. It raises our immune system when we speak helpful words to ourselves. And in fact, apparently when we exercise self-compassion, when we stop beating ourselves for not living up to some crazy standard set by something else or someone else for our own ego, if we stop saying, I'm not a good enough daughter or a good enough man or a good enough teacher, or you fill in the blank, when we show ourselves self kindness, apparently, we start showing it to everyone else. Isn't that a miraculous thing? So I'm going to say that for abstinence during the time of Lent, I'm going to look at the ways in which I show myself beatings and whippings, and I'm not enough. I'm going to remind myself that God thinks I'm an amazing and beautiful creation and sees only the love that I am. I'm going to choose maybe one piece of my life where I am particularly hard on myself, and I'm going to abstain in Lent from whipping my master's oxen or my God's beloved child. I'm going to choose self-compassion in just one incident, and then I want to see how it feels in my body and my life and how I hope it will flood the world around me with compassion as well. So that's my idea for abstinence. You, of course, can choose the way that you're whipping your master's oxen and choose for yourself. The next one is fasting. This is actually something I love about the Church Fathers in the 1100s. And that's a short list, I have to admit. The people in the 1100s, 
especially in the Germanic countries where Christianity really took off, by this time in the calendar were starving. They were starving. The meat, if they had had any at all, had been salted into an unrecognizable mess and had long been eaten. The vegetables were gone. They were rooting through the snow often, even to eat grass. So the idea of fasting during Lent was actually designed to ennoble a suffering that people were living through. It was meant to give them dignity in a time of year where they might be hard on themselves for not having enough. It was meant to show them that this difficult, challenging time was actually a sacred time, a time that could bring them closer to God. Well, how do we fast in our own lives? What brings us closer to God? I think like the peasants, we are in many ways starved, not just for self-compassion, but we're starving ourselves by not seeing the things that we do have. If we don't have to root around in the snow to eat grass, as our ancestor did, we may feel guilty about the blessings that have been brought into our lives. Guilty if we sleep in a warm bed. Guilty if we have food to eat. And yet, how is the world served by that guilty? Isn't the world better served if we can see instead the abundance that we have been given in all situations? I remember years ago reading a book which was simply titled Gratitude. It was about a man who had come to a place in his life where he had lost everything. He had become bankrupt, he had lost his marriage, he had lost his job. There was nothing in his life that he had counted on as a firm foundation that he still had. And living in a boarding house on government subsidy, he decided that what he did have he wanted to see. What he did have, he wanted to claim. And what he did have, he wanted to make the most of. So he began writing gratitude letters, one every day. And the first one was something simple to the person who ran the boarding house, simply saying thank you for the things that she did when she was dealing with a lot of people that were really down on their luck. And the second one was to a teacher he remembered way back in grade five who had had such faith in him. And as the days went on, day after day after day, he began to think of more people to be grateful to and more things in his life that were indeed blessings. And he realized that he had been fasting, living in a world where he felt there was not enough, when indeed he was living in a world of sacred abundance. So I think this year for Lent, for my fasting, I'm going to think about the ways in which I am starving myself from enjoying and seeing and sharing and noting the great blessings that are all around me. I may note down one blessing at the end of every day. Again, we've been shown that this has great value for us physically, mentally, emotionally. But it also turns Lent just as it did with uh, the first idea, into a sacred journey, into a time of enrichment. So that's abstinence, and that's fasting. Now we come to almsgiving. This is probably the easiest one to understand. The earliest church, long before the time of Jesus, made as a foundational mission giving to the poorest of the poor. In those days, it was women and orphans. In these days, it could be anyone in need. Almsgiving actually comes from a Greek word that means compassion. It means that you're not only giving material things, you're actually giving kindness, mercy, compassion, connection. So almsgiving during the time of Lent could mean anything we want, but it should have some kind of connection to us. I was speaking recently to someone who decided last year to follow these four tenets. And for her almsgiving, she decided she would give away one thing every day in Lent. Sometimes she bought someone a chocolate bar, sometimes she gave somebody some flowers, some days it was a compliment, another day it might be a smile. She said that what brought the richness to her life was that it made her realize, just as we did with gratitude, how much she had to give. Not just physical things, but 
as we say in true almsgiving, things that are given with joy, things that we have a connection to. She said she ended the period of Lent last, uh, last year knowing that her almsgiving had actually given her a more open spirit, a more generous frame of life, frame of viewing life. And she also said she felt wealthier. She simply realized how much she had to give. So there we have abstinence and fasting and um, almsgiving. We've got three of the four tenets of our when Ash Wednesday, our intention setting for Lent. And now we come to prayer. And you know what the wonderful thing is? If we observe any of those first three tenets, if we do any of those things that we've suggested here, we have already engaged in prayer. Because what is prayer? Other than calling on the energy, the love, the strength, the guidance of God, and bringing the best that we are from it into the world. Prayer is connection with the divine, however we see the divine. And we can do that by giving to ourselves, to others, by recognizing our blessings, living in gratitude, and certainly by making a connection between ourselves and others, by giving in any way. Those are all areas that teach us that prayer looks like so many things. And because we're the rebels of the Christian world, because we're the reformers of the Christian world, we can choose to pray by giving, by fasting, by um, abstaining, and by making this Lent anything that we want, by calling into our journey of these days until the Thursday before Easter, whatever is going to enrich us, and thereby, isn't it wonderful, enrich the world. So this year, I'm calling for a traditional Ash Wednesday and a traditional Lent. But traditional in the best sense for us. Recognizing that we don't live like they did in the 1100s, and there is something to be grateful for right there. But what they did have, and what we share, is a true desire to make this journey, not just from Lent, but through life, in the best way possible. Living in close connection with our divine, giving what we have to the world, and feeling that flow of love and energy and positivity and joy go out from us into the world that so needs it. Not just at Lent, but all year round. So here we go. It's not quite as Wednesday, but we can call it that this morning because we make the rules. But it's absolutely the first Sunday in Lent. We've got a few weeks to go until Easter. Let's think about what we want to do for abstinence, for fasting, for the other one, and for whatever the prayer. <laughs> what was the other one? Almsgiving. Almsgiving. And for prayer. Thank you. They just gave to me. It's time for Lent. Ready, set, Lent. Thanks be to God.
since we can't be together this year, I'm going to give you a suggestion for how to do your own blessing of the ashes to start the season of Lent. Some of you will have picked up packages of ashes from the church that were available on Saturday. If you did, those ashes were made from the palms that we took, uh, saved from Palm Sunday last year before Easter. And if you go on Facebook, you'll be able to see me, with a little help from Mac, burning those into the ashes that go into those packets. But if you didn't pick up one of those packets, don't you worry. You can still do a blessing. So you're going to want to hit the pause button, and you're going to want to go and get some olive oil, or any kind of oil. Even baby oil is going to do. Hit the pause button, and come back and join me. All right, I'll go package some wow. up. Set up. That Thank you nice. so much, Reverend. Oh, oh. Great. We have our oil, and some of us have our ashes. If you've got the ashes, you want to open the package, pour a little bit of the oil in. Just a tiny bit goes a long way. Stir it around with your finger, and then go and wash your finger. Believe me, if you don't, the ashes will get on everything, and they will last long before, after Easter. Come back and take your thumb. If you just have oil, put some oil in a dish and just use the oil. That is perfectly acceptable in many times and places. If you've got the ash and oil mix, rub your thumb in that. There's a tradition about why the priest or minister does the blessing with their thumb. The reason, believe it or not, is of all of the digits on our hand, this one belongs to the devil. I don't know why. This is the only other one that you could possibly manipulate a cross with, so we use our thumb. Part your hair if you've got bangs like I do. Dip your finger carefully into the ashes or just the oil and simply make a cross on your forehead. You can choose any blessing you want at this moment but I encourage you to make it a blessing that sets an intention for the time of Lent. So, please God, remind me that I'm your beloved child. Or, God is the strength by which I live, God is the light by which I see. The tradition then is to leave that blessing of ashes, or simply oil, on your forehead until it wears off on its own. So I always picture a lot of pillows with a lot of marks on them the morning after Ash Wednesday. It's a simple way to start your Lenten service, to set your intention for the time ahead, and blessings on everyone. Loving God, we, your people, offer these prayers. As we enter this season of Lent, we acknowledge the countless people on our planet seeking compassion and justice, and we pray for them. And personally, we acknowledge the many times when courage and commitment have failed us, yet you have loved us. We will observe Lent in our individual ways, a small personal sacrifice, or taking time to reorder some priorities, or to practice our faith more attentively. We pray for reassurance and peace throughout these days. We offer these community concerns for a young girl critically injured by a gunshot in our city. We pray that young people are offered opportunities to grow up with hope and respect for life. We pray for people affected by these winter storms, bitter cold, no power, perhaps no shelter, no way to meet their basic needs for warmth and food. We pray for guidance for our leaders here at home and for the leaders of our American neighbors, that they may govern wisely to bring about justice and peace for all. Be with the Hunking family related to me who have lost Vaughn, daughter, sister, and aunt. Comfort them as they remember her dedication to family, friends, community, and church. We pray for these people needing support and care. Dennis, Albert, Ruby, AJ, Sammy, Amy, Verna, and those we name in our hearts. We give thanks today for all who work for healing, health professionals, caregivers, teachers, ministers, social workers. We give thanks for those who have left their comfort zones and stepped up in innovative ways to support people who affected by lockdown and job loss. We give thanks for every goodness in our lives for the freedoms we share and the opportunities that lie before us. 
And we give thanks for Mona, whose birthday is tomorrow. Happy birthday, Mona. Amen. Now go out into the world. Go with a daring and a tender faith, knowing that the world is waiting for you. And may your Lenten journey begin with grace and end in joy. And may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit rest and abide upon us, each one, now and forever. Amen. Amen.